Uh, well, I want to welcome everybody today. Thanks for, for being here. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, to hear from some PNCA alumni about their unique journeys. Uh, yesterday, the Unlimited 2020 exhibition opened, and this year we had over 80 submissions. Um, I hope you take the time to click on that link and, and see the exhibition, see the range of incredible work that, that PNCA alums are doing uh, today. Um, uh, the idea of doing these panel discussions was a way uh, to bring the exhibition to life, uh, put some faces to the work, um, and also be inspired by those who continue to develop their creative voice. Uh, my name is David Cohen, uh, class of 1983. Um, I'm excited to help facilitate uh, these conversations and create a platform for artists to tell their story. Um, my experience at PNCA had a profound impact on my uh, life and career pathway, as I'm sure it has for those uh, who've joined us today. Um, as we listen to the artists participating in this, series, in this series, I'm hoping we can get a glimpse uh, into the diversity of expressions and directions that each person's PCVA experience has helped provoke. Uh, we have 25 alumni lined up over the next five weeks, hope, and we're hoping that you can um, tune into all five sessions. I think the same link will be uh, able to be used to, to, to connect with any of the, the sessions. So, so now um, I'd like to get to the panelists. Um, uh, today we have five artists here today. Gina Edelman, class of 1985. Sean Bracken, class of 2003. Rachel Anna Rosenkoter, class of 2016. Helen Hunter, class of 2019. And Hannah Bracken, Bracken sorry, class of 2020. Um, maybe as a way of introducing yourselves, uh, let's start off with a short story about how you ended up here today. Uh, what we'd like you to share, in a sense, is, is sort of the broad arc of your journey as a creative. Uh, why don't we start with Gina? Why, why don't you get us started, if you don't mind? Oops, unmute. All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Welcome, everybody. Um, Let's see, how did I get here today? Well, I was raised in Portland uh, by a couple of architects and I graduated from PNCA, like David said, 1985, after a couple of false starts at other colleges and others in other subjects, and then got an MFA from Columbia in 1987 in drawing and painting. Uh, I stayed in New York for about five years, exciting years with great jobs in the business world. And meanwhile, kept a very minimal studio practice going um, I then moved to Seattle and then to Portland to take over a family business, uh, which 32 years later, my husband and I still run. Uh, through those years, I mostly made my own shows happen in alternative spaces and schools and colleges and business and urban environments. Um, I had a few artist residencies and got a few grants along the way. I had a couple of gallery associations over the years, all of them short-lived. Um, honestly, I had uh, little time to devote to a creative practice, but not enough to grow to a professional level. Um, I also had a couple of kids and a couple of elderly parents to look after. Um, after a crushing experience with a gallerist, I gave up the hustle and the drive to find representation, uh, which was a big relief at that time. And uh, soon after became so desperate for a creative practice that I started drawing on index cards and taking photographs while stopped at lights, uh, in between meetings and while waiting for kids, etc. cetera. Um, that really saved my life and a slow, steady, much more quiet practice began. Um, which ushered in this really most creative uh, time for me, which is still happening. Um, even though my business life now is uh, off the stress charts, frankly, owning restaurants during a pandemic is a whole lot of no fun. Um, but my studio life is the best that it's ever been. Um, I'm finally not compartmentalizing the various ways that I practice. Uh, writing, photography, painting, and drawing. And um, I'm a much happier, 
uh, and fuller artist uh, as a result. So that's how I got here. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Sean, why don't you go next? Okay, so uh, my story is kind of like I was, um, I was, I was born in Wyoming, in in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and my my family started moving really early, like divorce and moving. My mom went to art school, and then she was an art teacher, and then and then moved to be. My stepdad wanted to be an artist, so he studied art in Colorado, and then art therapy. My mom moves to New Mexico to become an art therapist, and then I moved to the mountains and. Um, realized I needed to go to an art school. So uh, basically I like uh, moved to Portland to go to PNCA in 2000 because my sister lived there and I knew that I could like have a f like a foot in the door kind of. And um, so that was it, it was, and so I ended up staying there uh, and um, I stayed in Portland until 2005 when I moved to Los Angeles and uh, went to grad school at Claremont Graduate University. Um, when I was in Portland, I, I worked at the Portland Art Museum with another alumni, um, Deborah Royer, and um, and got to really got to spend a lot of good time with her in the library there uh, at Portland Art Museum. Um, and then, uh, but but really, my trajectory was always I was always before art school. I was doing a lot of traveling, and whenever I could, I would come out to Europe and. So uh, it was always, and when I was in Europe, I was kind of like absorbing, I was like consuming and I felt like I had to like have something to, to bring. And so it was like grad school. And then I was like, as soon as I finished grad school, I was looking for some way to get my toe in the door in, in Europe. And, um, and so that's, that basically it was like on my way to Europe, I ended up um, stopping in Missouri where my mom was living at the time and teaching there at a university for a year and teaching art there. And then, yeah, and then I moved out to Madrid and um, basically like some luck I had with galleries in Los Angeles helped me become established in Madrid. And after about three years, I started having a little bit of success as an artist in Madrid, but mostly I was teaching English. That's why, that's kind of like, that was my like day job, like I'll, I'll be able to make it if I, if, so I came to Madrid because there was demand for English teachers. And so I lived here without papers for five years. Um, and man, the Mexicans I met here, thought it was the funniest thing ever, like, um, because I, I was the paperless one and they were not. And uh, so it was always a big joke. Um, but anyway, then I, I ended up, um, I got married to a Spaniard and we moved to Sydney, Australia, where I had some luck in the art world there through a connection I made in Madrid. And then I moved back to Los Angeles. And I've been living in the, the past three years, basically in between Madrid and Los Angeles until until COVID hit um, in February, that was basically like flights canceled, like the you know shows canceled. It was so now I'm just kind of like okay, I'm in Madrid and this is and and I'm not going back and forth now. I'm just I'm hanging out here and it's and it's cool. You know it's all right. It's good. So that's kind of yeah, great. Uh, Thanks for sharing. I'm exhausted just <laughs> thinking. Is that thinking three about... minutes? I hope that was less than three minutes. I tried. Oh, perfect. That was perfect. Okay, uh, good. Great. Okay, I'm out. Okay, thanks. Rachel, why don't you go next? Sure. So um, I was born and raised in Missouri between Kansas City and St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I earned my BFA in painting from Missouri State University and then moved out to Portland six years ago to earn my MFA in visual studies from PNCA, which was a very challenging but very positive experience. And um, shortly after finishing up the program, I founded an artist collective with several um, of the other students from the program with me called Killjoy Collective, um, which was this feminist, gallery exhibition space um, that we operated for two years and uh, tried to have like a different show every month whether that was a group show or um, 
a solo show, just giving a platform for women and femme folks and um, non-binary folks uh, to show their work. And then um, after that, and as well as during part of that, I worked in the design department at Socket To Me, which is a local sock company, um, designing these really ridiculous, uh, cute, goofy socks. Um, and then I was laid off from that job, sort of like around the time that the pandemic was starting this year. Um, but luckily it kind of aligned with, um, for the last couple of years, I'd been working on illustrating a tarot deck. And it was around that time that I crowdfunded successfully um, the printing of the first edition of the deck. And just this August, the first edition um, of the Rainbow Heart Tarot arrived. Good. And so Good. that's been my main um, focus and um, where quite a bit of my creative energy has been going um, in recent times. But um, yeah, that's kind of the overall story of my trajectory. Currently, I'm just slinging the tarot deck and doing some teaching and taking some kind of, you know, graphic design or illustration type jobs on the side and patching it together that way. So Perfect. yeah, uh, grateful wow. to be here. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, Helen, why don't you go next? Awesome. Uh, yeah, so, um, I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and I came out to Portland in 2006 to go to Lewis and Clark. Um, I got a BA in history and writing, and um, I've always kind of been a creative person. Uh, short fiction and poetry was my jam for a long time. And then after I graduated from Lewis and Clark, um, I kind of got into preschool teaching um, it was never really like a plan. I just kind of like found myself teaching preschool all of a sudden. And I did that for five years. That wasn't the career for me and decided to um, enroll at uh, PNCA for a BFA in 2016 um, when I was 28, I think. So a little non-traditional path there. Um, so I finished up that program in 2019, and I, I guess that was in uh, December, when I had great big plans for this year, um, which uh, have not totally panned out. Um, so my art career has not totally taken the um, route that I was planning. Um, I had done some internships and been involved locally with like Converge 45 and Holding Contemporary Gallery, which has really helped me kind of like network and get to know the Portland's gallery scene. But um, since things like First Thursday aren't happening and like some galleries are open, but some are not, um, I've managed to um, kind of build a persona on social media. Um, I do a lot of uh, like pro wrestling fan art. Um, I found myself like really enjoying pro wrestling, which is something I never thought I would say. Um, and I got a bunch of followers and I've done a bunch of commissions since uh, the beginning of COVID, um, just oil paintings of wrestlers and wrestling scenes. And, um, you know, I, I call this, it's, it's very much fan art, um, which at first, I found myself kind of looking down on, like, is this really what I want to be doing? Um, but I really enjoy it, and I really like making artwork that brings other people joy. And, um, like, what else do you expect life to be? <laughs> so um, it's a little, a little unexpected, but, um, you know, I'm interested in how I can push that into uh, more of a fine, fine art uh, realm and I'm really just getting started career wise. Um, so, you know, we'll make it through the rest of the pandemic and kind of see what happens after that. Great. Great. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Hannah, why don't you go? 
Hi, hello. Nice to meet all of you, albeit virtually. Okay, this is not going to work. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so my, my trajectory, um, I'm from Eastern Oregon, originally a tiny town about an hour from Boise. It's right on the Idaho border there. Might as well be Idaho. Um, and in the town of 3,000 people that's surrounded by agriculture, there's A, not a lot of art, and usually your kind of career trajectory is probably going to be in something that'll be a bit more mm, uh, perhaps stable <laughs> than art. So um, uh, science, uh, biology was what I started studying originally uh, in school and undergrad with a vet medicine focus, and I worked in vet clinics and such. And so I took a break um, a couple years in central Idaho, just kind of like youth retirement for a couple years, um, working as a barista in Ketchum, Idaho, and got this job uh, after the cafe job to be a gallery assistant for Arobra Press. And they were based in San Francisco and they came and did their gallery in Ketchum. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, I could do that job. What is printmaking? I don't know, sure. And so it was a monotype gallery and that's like how it introduced me to art. And so then I continued, uh, went back to school to finish my undergrad in science uh, at SOU in Ashland, Oregon, Southern Oregon University. So I'm studying science and was just uh, burnt out, sitting in a physics class thinking like, why am I doing this? I'm gonna either 180 my college trajectory or I'm gonna drop out of school. So if I 180, what's the opposite of science? Hmm, art. Um, so I gave that a go and immediately loved it. And I'd always been doing art as a child, as youth. Um, and so it made sense and just kind of flew with it. Um, in undergrad, there's the student galleries on campus in SOU. There's seven different spaces and I ran those for two years as gallery director. Uh, helped produce the Oregon Fringe Festival, which is theater, music, and visual arts in like unconventional spaces. And um, then wanted to continue, you know, studying art. I had felt like I had some momentum and was really enjoying it. And graduate school was something that was presented as an idea to me. So I looked at uh, Pratt and SAIC and U of O and various other institutions, deciding where I wanted to go and had multiple options, but ultimately landed on PNCA because it's, I realized it's incredibly important with the content and the themes and focus of my work and for myself to be close to home, to be in Oregon, uh, to be able to have my creative research and my material research here in the state. And so I did the MFA in print media. I just graduated this spring, which let me tell you is a very interesting time to graduate. And I'm glad <laughs> that I'm out of school, but I'm also like, wish I was also in school still in some ways <laughs> with all of this precarity. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. And I'm extremely grateful for all that has been given to me and stability that I do have and uh, grateful for PNCA. Um, so yeah, did the MFA in print media with a, a dual degree in the MA in critical studies. So it was a three year program basically as a three-year MFA is the way I like to describe it with extra research. So that's, um, and now I'm extremely grateful that I actually have a job in my career, my focus. I am a studio manager at Newhouse Press here in town. Uh, it's a letter letterpress based art studio uh, run by Chris Chandler. And so I'm his production assistant and also a studio manager. We do community workshops, develop his work. I make, I get to make my own work there. Um, I'm helping teach print installation at PNCA right now with Gordon Barnes, tutoring some kids, and I'm also uh, a uh, food delivery by bike. I'm a bike courier around the city. So I got multiple things going, but I'm extremely grateful to be working in my field and, and using all the things I went to school for to be trained in printmaking. It's blows me away every day. <laughs> Anna, thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, wow, what great stories and an amazing variety of folks we've got gathered today. Um, just want to remind folks, who, uh, anybody in the audience who's come uh, just recently, do be, uh, have your mute, mics on mute. Uh, um, close down your video, stop your video. And then um, also, if you pick speaker view, the little icon in the top right, 
uh, you'll get to see the speakers uh, a little more prominently. Um, so uh, the let's see um, the next let, let's go to the next question. And and actually, Hannah, why don't, why don't you start? Um, the, I think what what makes us unique as artists um, is that we each have a sort of our own brand of what I call curiosity. Um, and I'm wondering if, if each of you could talk a little bit about what pushes your curiosity button um, or, or what's the inspiration that underlies your creative work. Um, yeah, Hannah, why don't you get us started? Yeah, I think there's a lot of aspects that guide my uh, creative inquiries. Um, but I think resoundedly the, the constant one that's always present is um, thinking about audience and thinking about place and what ones are important to me. And that almost always seems to circle back to home. It circles back to rural communities, um, which are often very, you know, disinvested um, with access to the arts and education. And that's who I would love to talk to. Um, and more like expanded from that, like my, my hometown, I feel is uh, very emblematic of being um, a kind of quintessential example of the American West in some ways. And that's where my focus of art is usually is about American West and um, investigating, interrogating what it means as like a social political body in the American West, what made this country what it is, what made the West specifically what it is um, within a settler colonial paradigm. Um, and so in questioning, like, what is our role as in myself, a settler colonial body in this place? Um, so for me, resoundedly, it's, it's thinking about home. Uh, another specific one that seems to always influence how I approach these things and it's kind of connected with audience and like who I want to speak to is um, thinking about the Malheur Refuge occupation. I'm not sure if everyone knows about that event, but basically the nitty gritty in 2016 in central eastern uh, Oregon burns. There's a, a wildlife refuge that was occupied by a white militia group. Um, that were protesting that the land be given back to the rightful owners, that being uh, white ranchers of the area. <laughs> and so that went on for like six weeks in 2016. And them as characters, the Bundy family, it was like the main kind of leaders as characters, like this patriotic, aggressive um, kind of you know, character, so to speak, is just extremely... Uh, interesting to me and that's a very diplomatic word to use uh, and I think it's especially interesting it continues to come up um, specifically with things like the Proud Boys and the moment that we're in um, so it's kind of home it's Eastern Oregon it's the American West and the Bundys <laughs> not to be confused with Ted Bundy as often happens <laughs> thanks Anna um, uh, Rachel why don't you go next Sure. So a lot of my work has to do with mysticism and with ecstatic experience. And so I'm really interested in a lot of the um, kinds of traditions and iconographies that end up crystallizing around these states. And, um, and so with an example being um, a system like the tarot, which is this highly developed visual system um, that's kind of, that's, that's so of mystical tradition. Um, and yeah, so ultimately it's so much content to work with. Um, and ultimately these experiences are unrepresentable, which is what makes it something that I can just return to again and again and really never um, exhaust or get to the bottom of in any concrete way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely for me um, the most generative and interesting uh, area of exploration as an artist. Great, thanks. Gina, why don't you go next? Okay. Um, uh, what I really try to dig into is uh, 
figuring out what makes communities and um, different characters and different roles. And early in my life, I thought I'd be a playwright. You know, that never happened, but I still think that I, I um, kind of function out of that, that uh, frame of thinking. Um, and furthermore, making communities and then asking uh, why we still feel so alone. So um, um, I'm really interested in humans and uh, how we relate with each other. Um, and I'm an abstract formalist also. So I'm very excited by expressive line and color and um, by very quiet contemplative uh, picture spaces. Um, so um, I like, you know, what Helen said about um, bringing people joy. Um, you know, I'm really into adding to the gene pool of good in the world and also of beauty. And um, I realize that uh, can sound, may sound naive uh, with all the, you know, stuff that goes on. Um, but I want to contribute, um, you know, to the well of good, uh, just to try to reinforce it in our lives, um, every day. Um, and, you know, I guess in my life specifically, um, uh, yeah, I guess yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty much it. it sounds very yeah. general, but, uh. No, no, that's great. Um, yeah, I actually think we don't talk about beauty enough. Um, so that's yet a whole other topic. But, um, but thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Sean, why don't you go? Okay. Um, yeah, so my main topic of interest in my, in my thing is, is about uh, un -word wordless, wordless uh, experience like that the the life of emotions and the sensations of being, um, and and then those sensations of being uh, in groupings or alone, and um, it's basically like that. And then when it comes down to it, like why I do it, I I kind of like I have to do it because if I don't do it, then I feel really like not right. So there's that, and then. So it goes back to Lucinda Parker had written once for one of her shows, she wrote that um, art is a shield against pain. And um, I think, and just recently that has been kind of like a thing that popped back. Um, and um, in, my, in my thoughts, um, one of the things that, that fascinated me as a child and continued to fascinate me until I kind of like understood how science worked was how, for example, a cassette tape is this black strip, but all of the sound comes out of it and all these videos come out of it, right? And then um, just recently, I've been kind of like seeing my work, uh, well, not just, but it's, you know, it's been a while anyway, whatever. My work has become kind of like a cassette tape, only the cassette tape that I want it to be, right? So this is recording everything that I'm experiencing. This is my documentation and the way I see it is it's also a blank cassette for all the people who experience it. The more time you spend with it, the more you record in it and being non-objective abstract. It's not like a, it's not a bunny or a monkey. It's, um, it's a, it's an, it's, it's blank. It's a blank cassette, right? So you, it, then you put the things that aren't already identifiable into that space you know and so that's kind of like the theory and and i mean i don't i don't like to get into metaphysics but it kind of sometimes it comes across a little bit metaphysical but you know it's just kind of like it is what it is and that i didn't want to say that but that was it's it's the object it's an object <laughs> which is what you see it's color paint and uh, graphite on canvas that is its essence and nothing more technically. But, um, and I see it as that, um, but I also can't help but experience things in, in, you know, things come back to me when I'm 
around places that I've been or, you know, when I hear music that I heard at a particular time, when I see these paintings years later somewhere, I have like visceral feelings and um, sensations and memories that come back to me that have been trapped in this, in these images. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, okay. I think we always deal with this duality. It's our art is an object, but it's also more than an object. So uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basic. Yeah. So that's you. You got it. That was easy. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, cool. So that's that's it. That's where yeah, I'm coming thanks. from. I'm making, yeah, all thanks. right. Yeah. Cool. Helen, why don't you share with us? Yeah. So um, my I find my art existing kind of in two different realms. I have my pro wrestling painting that I mentioned that is, um, like Gina said, very much rooted in joy. It um, is kind of indulgent to me to go. I, I started painting pro wrestlers actually when I was at PNCA and I needed to kind of craft a painting assignment for myself. And so I was like, how can I make watching wrestling into homework? Um, and I ended up doing a series of a dozen paintings that were these really energetic screenshots of um, Japanese women's pro wrestling matches that are really um, kind of brutal and uh, create these scenes that you're like, what am I even looking at? Um, so uh, that's kind of like the fan art. Um, realm of my painting. And then I have this other uh, kind of adjacent practice that um, the more I think of it kind of comes down to a similar approach I took when I was writing poetry um, back in my first experience at an undergrad where I'm using painting um, kind of like as a journaling tool. And I don't always under, well, I usually never really understand what's going on at first, like I don't really come up with a composition um, before I start painting. I just add elements and then kind of let the painting develop on its own. And so that's very much what my tiger painting for um, this show came out of. Um, it was part of a series that I started at the beginning of COVID just about the pandemic and about this insane time that we're a part of. We're just trying to process all of the emotions and current events. And um, so I, uh, in this realm of painting, um, find myself making very narrative work that involves symbols. And as somebody who has always enjoyed history, you know, that's what my first degree was in. Um, I find myself doing a lot of research. I'll cut I'll, a symbol will kind of like stick with me in this case, the tiger, um, which actually kind of came out of um, Tiger King, <laughs> which is a little silly to admit, but um, there was a period of time when it seemed like a lot of people were watching and talking about Tiger King and it created this, um, it, it, it was a train wreck of a show that everyone seemed to want to watch about this insane economy where people just wanted to be close to these tigers that were dangerous but also like not treated well and so i ended up doing more research about tigers and the symbol the the, the different things they represent in different cultures both in contemporary times and historically and um so that's how i came to make the tiger the subject of this painting um, but I ended up doing, the painting is named after, um, like the first line of a William Blake poem, um, that I came across in my research and, um, uh, so yeah, so this, um, like I said, it doesn't always like make sense to me right away what I'm doing, but then the painting eventually tells me like, Hey, I think I'm finished now. Um, and that's how I know to put it aside. And then usually like a couple months later or just sometime down the road, it might click to me what I was thinking or what I'm getting out of it. And um, that's a lot like how I used to write poetry where I would 
come up with symbols and then the poem would kind of come together, but it wouldn't really make sense right away. Mm. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay, let, uh, next question. Um, I kind of uh, asked you all to think a little bit about um, obstacles and barriers to the creative process for you expressing yourselves. But I also, I guess, and given our COVID situation now, obviously that's thrown a wrench into all of our ideas, plans, uh, goals. Uh, but, but also I, I will put, put it out there to think about um, opportunities too. What, not only obstacles, barriers, but opportunities that, that you've experienced. Um, and, um, and Helen, why don't, why don't we start with you? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, like I said, my uh, my art career is really just starting, and I got a solid like month and a half of feeling like the world was my oyster. And you know, I got um, one of my thesis paintings into a group show uh, at a gallery in Maryland that I was lucky enough to. I have family nearby, so I went and attended the opening. Um, at, at the beginning of February, and then all of a sudden, you know, the pandemic did, and um, and things changed. And I'd say, in the what nine months I've had since finishing at PNCA, um, managing to make art in spite of my mental health has been kind of one of the biggest um, impediments that I've had to deal with. Like at first during lockdown, I was like, hell yeah, I don't have to go to work and like, I'm gonna get unemployment and I'm just gonna paint all day. And that um, was motivating for a little bit. And then, um, and then things got a lot more serious uh, and scary. And with, um, you know, everything happening with the, the protests of, about police brutality um, really started to make me question, you know, as a white person, like what kind of power do I have as an artist? What is my responsibility? Um, I uh, raised some money for a national bail fund painting, um, like selling paintings, which I felt like I, you know, was how I could contribute because the other obstacle I've had is that I am pregnant. I'm like five months pregnant with twins. Um, and so I couldn't, go protest. I couldn't, um, for a while I couldn't paint because the smell was like a lot and it made me feel sick. And I have, I'm lucky enough to have this space where I can get a lot of ventilation and I can safely paint with oils. But for a couple of months, I was like, I can't be around the smell at all. And then, um, you know, and this is not an impediment that everybody is going to experience, but a fair amount of artists will choose to have families and choose to be pregnant and um quite literally like that is my biggest impediment right now i can't stand for very long um i have a stool involved but there's a period of time where i had to nap all the time <laughs> like I, could, I was awake to eat and then took naps and um so I'm kind of wrapping my head around the idea that like making big paintings like this is going to become harder and harder when the babies come. It's, I'm going to have to take some time off painting. I'm going to need to maybe transition into smaller work or digital work, which is another thing that I do. Um, and just be flexible with my expectations about what my art career can be in the next year or so until um, I'm out of the haze of like new parenthood. So, yeah. Well, well congratulations, actually. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> um, Hannah, why don't you talk a little bit about barriers and obstacles? Yeah, obstacles and boundaries. Um, I think quite literally my work is about boundaries in a lot of ways, or it has been with my thesis work. I'm just going to share my screen and kind of talk while I do that. And hopefully all that goes well. Um, so uh, my thesis work words to that effect was making signs that mimic no trespassing signs with letterpress. Um, and instead of saying, no, this isn't for you. Um, 
don't enter. It's more of invitations for self-regard. Um, and I feel like what has been my biggest obstacle in my art in general, and I think will continue to be something to navigate is kind of, you know, I'm maybe going to just answer the same question over and over is like audience. Um, and so the whole idea of this project was over 120 miles near my hometown to install hundreds of signs and literally just literally disrupt the daily um, kind of passage of landscape um, and hopefully engage people to see the fence in a different way and specifically uh, white white bodies and so what I'm getting to is I think within topics of environmental well-being within topics of settler colonialism uh, talking about like indigenous land stolen land land back campaigns what does it mean to be a white settler body and what is the role and how can we engage that audience how can i engage that audience in a way that um, one doesn't center necessarily the white experience but also allows for like a level of healing. And I tend to use the word hospicing. Um, I use that in my thesis is like, we see this, like the way that things are, the structure that we are held within as like um, kind of uh, represented by the fence, the boundaries that we are held in, the structure of settler colonialism. How can we see that system for what it is, take care of it in, a, in an empathetic way, not to like hold it up, but allow it to like kind of die off, you know, and lead for something new, which requires a lot of empathy. And so I think what the what I'm getting at largely is <laughs> I've experienced critiques um, of like maybe romanticizing the West, romanticizing a certain perspective but re really what I'm trying to communicate is like that's where I can work I can work by talking to other people of my identity and my positionality to get them to see past that to empathize to understand to work past our racist like um, structures and like ways of beings and habits and mindsets and so on so that we can collectively kind of work at like moving into the future so I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it's a very large obstacle, I think. Um, but I think considering the placement of art, and for me, that's like this, I'm going to use the term site-specific installation of bringing art to the people, removing it from that gallery context, even though I think that has, you know, a usage and a pertinence. Um, What's the message to be intended? How do you communicate? How do you share that? Hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that because I have no idea how long I've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. That's had a thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, um, Sean, why don't you go next? Cool. Well, that that was good. Good to see that because I'm a chronic trespasser and like uh, yeah I, I've been chased off people's lands. <laughs> it's been yeah anyway yeah but, fight the system yeah right but you know it wasn't about that it was just like I want to go there I want to go there you know like they're like Whoa. anyway whatever it's 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 seen as a different thing here it's like uh, socialist nations like is land and ownership and things like that is but anyway um limitations for me are quite honestly like i've um i've always been under this thing where it's like creativity uh, necessity breeds creativity and so when for example i moved to madrid i was broke and i started making stuff out of uh, like stuff i found on the street you know shoe boxes um anything with color on it i wanted that and then i ran out of like blue then i had the black paint and i had the white paint that was the cheapest paint i made that um, so it's like, um, you know, like the need, the need drives the, 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 you know, right now I feel like I live in the lack of, lap of luxury. Like I've got these super expensive, like bright colors. I can use them and I can spend money on them and I can do whatever I want with that. But then like, for example, in the quarantine, there was like this, the, the lack of touch, like, uh, painting was just like another, like, uh, distance from 
contact. And so I started working, getting back into terracotta and it was just like touch, you know, like everything was about like touch, rubbing, rubbing and touching, like making bubbles, whatever, you know, like anything to like have physical contact with something. And I think, I mean, quite honestly, like being broke and not having a gallery moving into Madrid, it was like I met street artists and started just painting on the streets. And, and that was like community building and another just way to release. So like, I've never really felt restricted as far as like that in answer to that question. But um, when the quarantine hit and then all of a sudden it was like, you can't go outside and play, you can't show your stuff. And then I was like, how you show? Well, you show it online. And and so I put together uh, an international exhibition of artists where I just like shout out to everyone I knew and everyone that they knew. And I ended up getting like 115 people. And the, the only rule was like um, art made during quarantine. And so I put that together and then that I saw like some good, and, and the whole idea was that just to get something started because I was seeing all these galleries going a virtual exhibition, you know, like, and I look on it and it's like, dude, this is your website, you know, like, okay. I mean, that's cool. It is a virtual exhibition, but like I wanted like the next step. And um, so I kind of moved, tried to push that. And so if you, uh, on my website, there's a link to this, um, to the show that I put, ended up putting together, which then turned into like people doing shows that were like what I had imagined originally, where it's like, you're walking through the room and you turn the corner, you know, like, um, I didn't have that technology, but I did what I could with what I had available and what I felt that anyone around the world would readily have available. So like no extra necessary downloads to see this show, you know, kind of thing. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of like, that, that was it. Basically the quarantine was the biggest thing where it was like, boom, that really, really, really made me like contemplate, like, like, how am I going to do this? And I was, um, I hung some paintings from my balcony so that anyone who was walking on the street or the ambulance would see it, you know, whatever. Um, that, that, you know, that's, why, that's, what, that's why I brought up the opportunities, barriers lead to opportunities. Yeah, and, exactly. Exactly. So there you go. Yeah. So that's the way I see it. Like, I think it was, um, you know, it was, it was like painful to put that website together because it was just like another status. I had to be like seated and doing this other thing and, but in the end, you know, it was like the, the same kind of energy I felt I was able to generate the same kind of creativity and, and pull um, and just different aspects of my brain and patience and, you know, dealing with people and um, coordinating kind of. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that dealing with people, that's got to be the hardest thing, you know, like as far as like, honestly, when it comes down to it, if you just, you know. That's the thing. So yeah, that's thanks. that's my thing. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, great. Gina, uh, talk a little bit about obstacles and barriers. All righty. That's so interesting. When you asked that question, it didn't even dawn on me uh, that the pandemic uh, was a creative barrier to me because it wasn't to me. But in any case, I would say that, um, you know, I could say making a living, I could say kids, I could say, you know, sick parents. Um, but honestly, the biggest barrier I have had in my creative life has been myself. And um, the lack of confidence that I've had for uh, decades in my work and um, thinking that it wasn't good enough or it wasn't uh, as good as all the other people who are having all the shows and all the galleries. Um, that was really uh, what held me back. And uh, uh, Sean in, in uh, Spain will know this, come cocos, uh, you know, expression. Um, so I, I got to a, a point where I just got really tired of uh, all the rejections and, um, and I got tired of trying to make work to impress gallerists um and i really like i said before i just really started all over again and um uh and the quarantine you know again aside from a really insane business life um 
the quarantine has really been uh, great for my studio life. Um, I have the uh, best, most tranquil uh, studio I've ever had in my life, in my own house. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess I would say that. <laughs> Again, the, the barriers, opportunities, uh, you know, flipping yeah. back and forth. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for sharing. Uh, Rachel, why don't you talk a little bit about barriers? Sure. Um, so in recent years, I think I usually would have said, said that the biggest barrier to me was just the hustle of life, working 40 hours a week, trying to get enough exercise and cook healthy food and see my friends and um and you know be part of art community all of that seemed to suck up so much time that i always felt like i was trying to like get my art practice in around the edges of everything else um but i would say that this pandemic it's it's been a little bit ironic to me that for all this time i was like oh if only i had this uninterrupted stretch of time to work um, and, and now that I have it, I'm actually facing, um, a different problem that Helen mentioned, which is just kind of, um, dealing with my own mental health during this time has been its own challenge. Um, just, just very emotionally overwhelming times, uh, personally and collectively and dealing with this political moment we're in with this pandemic and its attendant lack of touch and, togetherness in person and even the wildfires um, a couple weeks ago that was incredibly challenging and so um, yeah that's been that's been the hardest thing for me to contend with lately but I will say that there also have been um, a lot of opportunities folded into it there seem to be a lot more um, opportunities to engage with people online in a different way, like um, having studio visits or in, in the classes I've been teaching online, I've been just having visiting artists pop in all the time because all they have to do is sign into a Zoom call. Um, and then also, this time has really forced me to look at my own relationship to my work and to my kind of workaholism and um and find like healthier healthier patterns for myself um in that way and i think that that's also been kind of related to um learning how there's re this relationship between uh white supremacy and this idea that we need to always be productive and always be working and so Anyway, there's just been a lot of um, like interesting lessons and even blessings folded into this really bizarre, weird time that I don't think I could have anticipated. So, great. yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Wow, great, great responses from everybody. Um, we're, we're getting close to one o'clock and so we're gonna bleed a little bit over, but I wanna squeeze one more question in here. And it's really about PNCA and your experience at PNCA. Um, just one thing that comes to mind uh, to think about um, uh, what's really what's stuck with you from your time at PNCA and how has it impacted the, the work you're doing and your life? Um, uh, actually, Rachel, why don't we start with you? Sure, it's hard to boil down to just one thing, but I think I would say the people I've met through PNCA and specifically working with my mentor. a really um, positive experience for me and changed the trajectory of my art practice in some ways. So just really, really grateful for that. Great, thanks. Um, Sean, why don't you go next? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know, um, just the whole, uh, the whole experience of it. I, uh, one thing, like, I, I don't know. I really, I couldn't, like, I couldn't, like, say one thing. Um, <laughs> I couldn't, it was like, there's like way too many things. I, I was a security guard there. So I kind of like the thing about the thing about PNCA, what I found when I went there, if I could make one thing, was it everything that I wanted, 
I just had to go for it. And then I got it. And that's where I saw people who didn't go for it. They didn't get it. And um, so it was like, I was like, I want to be the security guard because then I can sit at the door and work on my art and get paid. And it was like, and I was like, who's the guard? Who's the head of the guards? And it was like, she is. And I was like, blah. And I was like, I want this job. And she's like, I just hired someone. I was like, oh, and she goes, but you know what? I think that, that I'm going to give it to you. And she called that person up and she fired her. And, and the thing is like, it's like, it was just weird. And then I was like, I want to work in the art museum library. And I went there and I was like, but I want this job. I have work study. And it was like, okay. I don't ever work with men, no man in here, you see, but eh, it's free and we'll give you a shot. And so it was like one day a week, it's okay. And then they tried me out. I was like, okay, you can come in every day of the week. And, um, but it was like that. And I had like seven jobs um, and they were all different jobs um, around Portland, just like trying to, I thought I had this idea that I could like pay for the school while I was going there. <laughs> like. And then that didn't, that drove me insane. Like that was like impossible. Okay. Seven jobs. I mean, there was no time. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so that's it. Like go, if you go for it, you just gotta, you gotta like really, really, you just gotta go for it yeah. and don't. A, a you know. great lesson to learn. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, Hannah, why don't you go? Yeah, I think the one thing is a pretty big thing, and that would just um, access to the critical studies program and being in that. Uh, that was, I think, one of the main deciding factors for me to go to PNCA. You know, I said being in this location, this region, and the material is incredibly important, um, but I really wanted to push uh, my fear of academic, academic writing, um, and I pushed it. And I have reasons for disliking it and refuting it now. And I'm able to articulate that, I think. And I think specifically what happened in the critical studies program that I'll always carry with me, um, Professor Taylor Egan, he teaches in the critical studies and he's also this amazing dancer choreographer for his creative practice amongst many other things. But he's, he was teaching research for creative practice and very early on in my three years at PNCA that course in his teaching um, broke my mind out of research has to be in books research has to be in images research has to be a certain like very western very um, analytical empirical approach to so this research is sitting in your yard and watching a butterfly land on a leaf you know, and research is this very embodied thing that is always there and that can be a creative practice. And so that played a huge role in how I responded to the fence as an object, to the fence in relation to my body and to relation of this collective body. And mm -hmm. obviously that's like a current theme and I think the fence is gonna continue to be an inquiry for a long time for me. Um, but that idea of embodied research is absolutely huge within the critical studies. Great. Hannah, thanks so much. Uh, Helen, why don't you go next? Uh, yeah, so um, I had a teacher uh, in the painting department, Roy Tomlinson, who in discussing, um, you know, how to navigate um, a life with like regular mental health um, flare ups uh, and also being um, an artist, he told me, you know, you just gotta show up to work every day. And you might not be painting, you might not be painting, you might not be painting something amazing, but like you have to show up and like sweep your studio or stretch a canvas or like edit your website or do what you need to do to make your career continue to move forward and treat it like a job and not like um, a high. And I think I, I've just been coming back to that a lot, um, particularly during the pandemic when there have been days where I've just been like, what am I even doing? Like, why, what, what, what does it matter that I am painting pro wrestlers or talking about myself and painting? And um, those rough days um, 
pass and then I get good ideas and um, go from there. So it's kind of an element of faith, but also commitment to um, a practice that involves more than just like putting the paint on a canvas. Yeah, great. Thank you. Gina, why, why don't you respond? All right. Um, well, PNCA was a lot of things uh, for me. Uh, it was certainly the absolutely amazing teachers I had uh, there and their rigor and their uh, playfulness um, and being uh, so close to seeing what an artist's life uh, looks like. Um, I grew up with creative people around me. My, uh, like I said, my parents were architects and I had relatives who are uh, well-known artists. Um, but to really see day to day, but I guess uh, the rigor and the, I mean, I learned to draw at PNCA. I came to PNCA uh, with the single desire goal to learn to draw three-dimensionally uh, because I had never done that before. Um, and uh, four years of life drawing and the teachers that I had um, were just invaluable. And I, I remember things that my teachers told me every single day. I have written them all down. There's a long list. Um, just, you know, one-liners that I uh, use all the time to keep myself on track uh, and uh, to keep going. So I'm really grateful for that. Great. Well, thanks for sharing. Actually, thanks all, all, all five of you for, for sharing today. I wish we had more time. There's so much more we could cover. Uh, but really, uh, great stories, incredible diversity too. Everyone kind of coming from this, uh, to this, from this, uh, from a different place. So, th so thank you all for sharing. Uh, so I want to thank you all uh, for participating. Thank the audience for hanging in there with us today. Um, and I hope you all get a chance to sit in on the next four lectures that we're going to be doing over the next four weeks. So do join us. Um, uh, and if you could spread the word, let others know, who, folks who might enjoy this, uh, do let them know about these conversations. Again, please check out the Unlimited show. Uh, go to the link, click on it, see the, the artwork that alums are doing. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, next year, hopefully, Unlimited 2021 will be a real exhibition in a real space where we can actually get together physically as a community, but uh, we'll take this right now as we got it. Um, and lastly, remembering about the Laura Russo Distinguished Alumni Award, December 7th deadline. Anyone you can think of who would be appropriate, please nominate. Uh, thank you for considering that. Um, and thanks for being here today, everybody, uh, making this a meaningful event uh, for the school and also for the broader art community. So thank you, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, David and Faith. Thanks, for David. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.